Okay, uh, hi everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about the two papers by myself, Steve uh, Schenker, Chen Yu Yao, and also on one of them, Douglas Stanford. Which one your slides? Oh, there we go. Uh, so, space time wormholes have been involved in a lot of uh, recent developments. But in addition to helping us solve some problems, we see something that also needs to be a problem of their own, factorization problem. So, the basic version of this factorization problem consider the computation of two copies, two decoupled of copies of the boundary system in any of the to the product of partition functions for the two copies. But if you try to compute these partition functions using the bulk theory and include contributions from these space time wormholes, which link the two asymptotic boundaries, you appear to get an answer which does not factor. So in this talk, we're mostly going to be think, keeping in mind a specific simple example, uh, which is the special form factor. So the special form factor is you take uh, the partition functions, you beta, continue beta to beta plus it, where t is a real time. Sorry, I got my mask. Um, and then you square, uh, you take the modulus square to the partition function. So here I think there's an example. This red curve is the spectral form factor for a single instance of the SYK model. Um, so at sufficiently long times, the spectral form factor becomes very small. Uh, exponentially small in the entropy and oscillates erratically. It oscillates erratically around an average linear ramp in time. So to reveal this ramp, you can average over small time windows to get rid of the noise, or you can average over an ensemble of systems, like in a VSYK model. Both computations of the spectral form factor, uh, because it has two copies of this Z of beta plus IT, they may include space-time wormholes linking the two boundaries, um, in this case, we have a, a wormhole called the double cone. This double cone appears to give this linear ramp in a spectral form factor. Um, but it's not clear in this case what we need to add to get the factorizing noisy answer, this red curve. You only appear to get this linear ramp in black. This wormhole, the double cone, is not a good approximation of the spectral form factor without averaging. But it does give the right answer, for example, for the time average. And the time average is a perfectly reasonable thing to consider computing um, in a theory without an ensemble. So that suggests we should take this contribution uh, from, the, from the wormhole seriously. Um, there's a similar problem, a factorization problem related to the rupture wormholes. You give, give the page curve for an evaporating black hole uh, that's been described by uh, Douglas Stanford. So um, in this talk, we're going to consider a scenario or how partition functions can factorize while still including wormhole contributions. We're going to see this scenario realized in some toy models throughout the course of this talk. So first, let's consider computing one copy of Z of beta plus ID, later taking the modulus square to get the spectral form back. In this scenario, we take the ordinary Euclidean black hole contribution, which has pictures of this disk, and we add on to it something which we call a half wormhole, which gives a noisy contribution. We demand that these half wormholes, if you take two copies of them in average, average over time, the spectral form factor or some ensemble, they reproduce the wormhole answer. So that's our main requirement of these, these half wormholes. To compute the spectral form factor, we can just square the thing we saw in the previous slide, black hole plus half wormhole squared. This contains two, uh, a pair of half wormholes. Well, we can also try computing the spectral form factor in a different way where we sum over space times with the, both of the boundaries present, both of the Z of beta plus IT. This computation includes the wormhole, this double cone I mentioned. If we also included a pair of half wormholes, that would overcount this double cone wormhole. So instead, what we should do is add what we call linked half wormholes. The linked, the linked half wormholes have to satisfy this identity here. They're related to the wormhole contribution and the half wormhole contribution such that the linked half wormholes and the wormhole, both of these uh, contributions when we're computing the two Z's together, are equal to this factorized uh, answer from two unlinked half wormholes. 
It's useful to keep in mind a bit of an analogy here, where we think about the half wormhole as a sum over a bunch of random variables R. The spectral core factor is then this factorized double sum over two arcs. In this analogy, we can think about the wormhole as analogous to the diagonal part of this double sum. That gives the average of the spectral form factor. The link half wormholes are then analogous to the off diagonal part of this double sum. So if this scenario is relevant at all for ADS-CFT, our main questions are, what are the half wormholes? Then also, what are the linked half wormholes? And why do they behave something like the off diagonal part, roughly, of a pair of half wormholes? So from now on, what we're going to be doing is looking at some toy models of ADS-CFT. And we're going to see how these linked and unlinked half wormholes arise. So each of the models we're going to be studying are dual to an ensemble of bandwidth systems. So what we're going to do is focus on a single member of this boundary ensemble to compute partition functions, which factorize. In this case, the contributions of the half wormholes will depend on the precise choice of member of the ensemble we're focusing on. This is very importantly different than conventional ADS-CFT, where the half wormholes would have to give a unique answer, the answer for the single boundary theory. The first two models we well, we're going to study are the Morov Maxfield model, the MM model, or JT gravity. So in these models, uh, we compute sums over two dimensional topologies or geometries with n boundaries. In JT gravity, these are n asymptotically ADS boundaries. These sums over geometries with n boundaries compute quantities z sub n in the Morov Maxfield model, or z of beta 1 through beta n in JT gravity. The betas are the lengths of the asymptotic boundaries. So I picture here uh, some sample contributions to the uh, three boundary quantity in JT gravity. This is like the uh, calculation of three, three partition functions in JT gravity. And we've included one contribution here with the space time wormhole linking two of the boundaries. In both of these models, contributions of space times are suppressed by a uh, uh, factor involving their Euler character. Uh, this means that uh, this contribution, the second contribution is suppressed relative to this contribution. More complicated wormholes are even further suppressed. And the most important fact about these models for us is that these n boundary part uh, n boundary path integrals aren't ordinary partition functions, but are in fact equal to averages of boundary partition functions. So for example, in JT gravity, the n boundary quantity uh, shown here is equal to an average of ordinary partition functions, trace e to the minus beta h, where we've averaged h over some ensemble. In the Morov Maxfield model, uh, these n boundary quantities are averages over some number z, where we interpret little z here as the value of the partition function for the boundary theory. Fixing a member of the ensemble corresponds to choosing a specific z or h. So, we can give an interpretation to these theories and their graph integrals in terms of the quantum mechanics of closed universes. This goes back to the late 80s uh, in, with, in work by Coleman, Giddings, and Strominger, which was recently upgraded to the ADS-CFT context by Morov and Maxfield. So these path integrals with the wormholes and asymptotic boundaries, we can interpret as computing overlaps of states of circular closed universes or correlation functions in such states. We interpret the asymptotic boundaries in the path integrals as uh, corresponding to observables, z of beta. And here, for different betas, I'm uh, using a shorthand, uh, z, of, z hat sub i. Or these asymptotic boundaries can prepare states of the closed universes. In this picture, I've shown what it would look like to compute a correlation function of two, uh, two partition functions here. The state psi are prepared by a number of boundaries in the path integral uh, behind these purple lines. So here's the ket prepared by a number of boundaries and the bra as well. The observables in the correlation function give us two additional boundaries. To compute this correlation function, we sum over all space times connecting all of these boundaries. The space times can be disconnected and they can have wormholes and everything like that. An important case is a correlation function in the no boundary state where we do not include any extra boundaries to prepare the bra and the ket. These correlation functions compute these average partition functions, the n-boundary path integrals. 
We can also consider states psi, which are joint eigenstates of all of the observables, the z hats of i. These joint eigenstates correspond to a fixed member of the boundary ensemble, and they're known as alpha states. And they have eigenvalues, which are the value of the partition function in that fixed member of the ensemble. Then these correlation functions of these z's in an alpha state are just equal to products of partition functions for the corresponding member of the ensemble. We can equivalently express these partition functions as overlaps between two states. One of these states is prepared by adding n boundaries uh, into the path integral. These n boundaries correspond to the observable partition functions we're looking at. The other state in overlap is called size of alpha, which we think of as a combination of the bra and the ket of this alpha state. So here on the left, I've shown uh, a picture of the computation of a correlation function of z's in the alpha state, which remember is supposed to be equal to a product of partition functions. What we're doing here is just reinterpreting what these boundaries are, are doing. So on, in, on here, we have uh, our n partition functions that we're trying to compute, our boundaries on the bottom here, so you think of it as observables. Here, we're reinterpreting them as making a state. Then we take all the boundaries preparing the bra and the ket, put them together behind this red line, and think of them as making a new state size of alpha. Size of alpha projects onto a member of the ensemble. Roughly, we can think about it as corresponding to inserting a delta function in our averages. These overlaps need to factorize. So remember that these overlaps are equal to products of partition functions. The overlap with z sub n and psi alpha is a product of n partition functions. That's equal to this overlap with one z to the n power. We'll see that this requirement that these uh, overlaps factorize has a simple geometric interpretation. Um, but to do that, we have to confront a slight issue. So this issue is that uh, in both of these models, the Morolf mass field and JT gravity, uh, there's contributions from surfaces of very complicated topology with any number of boundaries, or in JT gravity, even contributions that are non-perturbative in the topological expansion. These contributions can complicate the geometric picture of these, of these uh, partition functions. These effects from these uh, surfaces with complicated topology or that are non-returned in the topological expansion can be important, for example, for the discreteness of the spectrum of this Z hat operator in the Morolf Maxfield model, or the discreteness of the boundary spectrum in GD gravity. To get around this, we can work in approximate alpha states where instead of focusing exactly on a fixed member of the ensemble, we, we uh, only approximately fix the member of the ensemble up to some error. We also have to focus on quantities which are insensitive to these discreteness effects. If we do that, then we can focus on just the simplest topologies, the disk and cylinder. Here, the disk is the black hole, the cylinder is the wormhole. All the other topologies give small effects, small contributions, and we can ignore them. A side note, which you'll hear about more probably in the next talk, is that in JT gravity, there are massive cancellations between terms of different topology. This actually leads to a generalization of this distance cylinder approximation we'll be working with, which includes non perturbative effects and is exact. So now we're going to get to the main thrust of this talk, having set up all these. Uh, so, so here, do, do you basically saying that? When you're uh, fixing the, the, the ensemble is the same as choosing alpha state? Yes. Yeah. So it's the same as choosing an alpha state. And then we're rephrasing it slightly by saying uh, we can think of that as choosing this state size of alpha. That's essentially equivalent to the alpha state. The size of alpha is going to project on this. So, what we're going to do for, uh, for now is study these, uh, these overlaps, computing part products of partition functions in JT gravity, uh, keeping only disks and cylinders. So I'm just going to be talking about JT gravity for now. The Morolf Maxfield model is, has, a, has a similar structure, and I'll make brief comments about it along the way. The basis uh, 
uh, this what we call the Z basis created by these boundary operators is highly orthogonal, non-orthogonal, even in the disk and cylinder approximation. This is because boundaries created by these Zs can cap off or annihilate with each other via the, the cylinder. These Z hat operators in this disk and cylinder approximation behave somewhat like the position operators of shifted harmonic oscillators. That motivates us to express them in terms of creation and annihilation operators and then use a Fock basis. The Fock basis will be a good orthonormal basis. In GD gravity, a natural choice for our Fock basis is to find states on circular spatial slices with zero extrinsic curvature, labeled by the lengths V of the slices. So the state with zero closed universes is the no boundary state we talked about earlier. There are states with one universe with one length V. The state with two, two universes with length V1, V2, and so on. These states are basically orthonormal. We've just chosen a little bit of a uh, uh, unconventional form that turns out to be technically convenient. So these states with finite lengths B um, are somewhat more of like a bulk basis uh, rather than the asymptotic Z basis uh, corresponding to states where we put these asymptotically ADS boundaries in the path integral. An important quantity for us as we go on will be the overlap between a Z state with one asymptotically ADS boundary and a B state corresponding to a geodesic boundary of length B in the path integral. This overlap is computed by the so-called trumpet geometry pictured over here. Finally, um, and a very important point as we go on is that these states with NZs and asymptotic boundaries have overlapped with these B states only up to N Bs. That's because each Z, if we write it as a sum of creation and annihilation operators, contributes one creation operator. So the NZ state has N creation operators or fewer than N creation operators. It does not have more than N creation operators. So this point here, the fact that these, N, the, these Z states have overlap with only up to N Bs uh, is very useful in this next thing we're going to do. We're going to take this B basis, um, the orthonormal B basis, the roughly orthonormal, uh, and we're going to insert a complete set of states in this basis into our overlaps of interest. First, we're going to look at the computation of one partition function, which is an overlap of the one Z state and this psi state. This is just the approximation I think that gets you only include trumpet at this, correct? Uh, yeah, just the disk and cylinder, yeah. So the first term from our uh, resolution of the identity is the zero, zero universe contribution to the boundary state. The second contribution includes one universe with length B. There are no contributions from more than one universe because the state Z here is orthogonal to all of those states. So these two terms here give us the disk, the Euclidean black hole contribution, and our half wormhole that we're looking for. So here, this, uh, this contribution this overlap here is equal to one by normalization. And the overlap with Z in the no boundary state is simply the disk. The second term here involves the one universe component of Psi. So this one universe component is a wave function of a single closed universe. Roughly, we can think about this half wormhole like contribution as uh, having, we, what we're doing here is projecting onto this, this state of a single closed universe at the end of this work. A side note is that this one universe wave function has an interpretation in terms of the uh, coarse graining of the discrete spectrum of the boundary Hamiltonian. So this state psi is prepared by including many asymptotic boundaries in the path integral. In fact, we're supposed to really sum over any number. It's a superposition of including any number of asymptotic boundaries. This gives us somewhat a bit of a geometric picture for this one universe wave function as coming from integrating out wormholes, connecting to these many boundaries inside, as well as disconnected space times. So in this picture here, on the left, uh, I pictured the overlap between the Z state uh, corresponding to this circular boundary and the psi state, which is corresponds to this red line. The psi state is a superposition of many boundary uh, states. On the right here, we can focus on the contribution where we pick up the one universe component of B, of Psi. 
That comes from contributions where our Z boundary for our partition function connects to any of the many uh, boundaries inside, which live inside this red dotted line. So we can connect to one of these boundaries with a wormhole. The rest of the boundaries can link together with wormholes or cap off on disks. To get this one universe wave function, we roughly just sum up over all the different ways of connecting the boundaries uh, within these red dotted lines. So integrating out all these boundaries, connecting the boundaries and integrating into out all the wormholes, connecting the boundaries inside, give us this half wormhole with a random weight given by this, uh, this one universe weight function. It's useful to use this wormhole plus half wormhole computation and demand that it reproduces the ordinary computation of average partition functions. For example, uh, we've just computed the partition function for a fixed member of the ensemble is a disk plus a half wormhole. Averaging that should just give the average partition function given by the disk. Averaging the square should give two disks plus a wormhole. This essentially requires us to have that uh, two half wormholes averaged are equal to the wormhole. From this, we can infer that this single universe wave function is a Gaussian random function with mean zero and this variance. This will need, we need this fact here, which will be useful later which is that the cylinder connecting two Z boundaries is equal to two of these trumpets glued together. So you take two trumpets with the same value of B and integrate over B. Roughly, we can think of this as saying, the cylinder here is diagonal in B. We'll use that analogy in a moment. So if we apply this uh, the fact that these statistics for this wave function, um, to the spectral form factor, we can show that a typical draw, uh, for a typical draw of this random wave function from this Gaussian ensemble, uh, time averaging approximately glues together half wormholes along their boundary to make a wormhole as well. So this averaging over here in the top, you average your half wormholes over the ensemble of alpha sticks, it makes a wormhole. But if we also take a fixed draw from the ensemble and average over the time on the boundary, it glues together these wormhole, these half wormholes to make a wormhole as well. So um, now what we're going to do is turn to the, uh, the different computation of two partition functions. Of course, we can take the computation we just did uh, as partition function equals disk plus half formal and square it. Or we can compute it in this different way, interpreting these two partition functions as an overlap between a 2z state and psi. Again, we insert a complete set of states in this B basis, summing over the number of uh, of Bs here, but the sum truncates at two Bs. That's because the two Z state is orthogonal to all the B states with more than two. So here we have a, a picture of this computation. Uh, we, we're looking at the overlap between the two boundary state and psi alpha denoted by the red line. One, one contribution of interest is this wormhole here. That comes from the zero universe component of psi alpha. It doesn't depend on the choice of psi alpha. Another contribution is this linked half wormhole piece. So the linked half wormhole piece involves the two universe component of psi. So here is a formula for this piece. We take two trumpets, one with uh, boundary length B, one with boundary length B prime, and we glue that to this two universe wave function. So note that these linked half wormholes are not a product of two separate half wormholes because this two universe component uh, can be entangled. In fact, we're gonna, we're gonna see exactly how that is true. So in this computation of Z squared, uh, when we're computing the two Zs together, uh, there are two not manifestly factorizing contributions, two contributions that don't appear in disk plus half wormhole squared. One is the wormhole, and one is this linked half wormhole. So let's take these two computations of partition function squared and compare them. They should be equal because they're just two different ways of computing the square of a partition function. One contribution, one computation has a wormhole, the other doesn't. The first computation, which manifestly factorizes, includes a pair of half wormholes. The second includes a wormhole plus a linked half wormhole. So these 
uh, contributions should be related by this identity here. Each three of the three terms in this expression have two trumpets, one on the left and one on the right. We can factor them out to get this sort of uh, relationship between the three terms on, uh, uh, between the, the one universe component of psi and the, and the two universe component of psi. Heuristically, we can think about the half wormhole uh, or half wormhole squared as a double sum over B and B prime, weighted by this product of one universe components. Then the wormhole is like the diagonal sum over B, with B equals B prime enforced by this delta function. This means that the linked half wormhole is roughly the off diagonal part of this sum over B and B prime. So this is the sort of structure we had uh, said we'd be looking for when I first introduced these linked half wormholes. It has some sort of off diagonal behavior. And note that in this case, in this computation, we didn't have to put in this off diagonal part by hand. Uh, it was naturally separated out because it comes from these two universe components. Now, a quick comment on the Morales Maxfield model. Um, so, in that case, instead of having a, a set of operators Z of beta, uh, we only have one operator Z. Correspondingly, there's no continuous B parameter to, to label our uh, states of closed universes. We only have one state for our occupation number in this box basis. We still find an analogous expression relating the half wormholes and linked half wormholes, where uh, it takes this form. The square of the one universe component of the state side is equal to the cylinder of this wormhole. We can give a little bit of a geometric picture for this linking by comparing the computations of the square of this one universe component and the two universe component. Where we think of creating the state psi by introducing many, many boundaries into the path integral and integrating out wormholes connecting to those boundaries. There's a stupid line here. Just ignore this line, please. I don't know where that's coming from. Um, so the first we're going to focus on this one universe component. We've already sort of discussed how you compute it. You represent the state psi using many boundaries in the path integral, some over all the wormholes connecting the B boundary, these side boundaries, as well as wormholes that connect different side boundaries. Then we simply square this, or take two up product of two of these to, to look at this product. On the other hand, uh, in this computation of the two universe component, our two B boundaries, B and B prime, share the same side boundaries. Roughly, we can think about these diagonal terms uh, as being excluded because the B and B prime boundaries can't connect to the same boundary and psi at the same time. This is pretty rough, but you can sort of see this in a lot more detail using some explicit representations of psi that I don't have time to go into. Okay, so now let's turn to the SYK model. This is the last model we're going to study. Um, so the SYK model is a theory of n myron fermions with random couplings. And so we can consider averaging partition functions over these couplings or not averaging them, choosing a fixed set of couplings. Conventionally, average partition functions in the SYK model can be expressed in terms of, in terms of uh, G sigma collective field intervals. These G sigma variables are a proxy for bulk variables. They describe correlations within a copy of the system or between pairs. If we compute the spectral form factor averaged in the SYK model, which averages over the random couplings J, we can represent it as an integral over these variables G sub AB, where A and B equals left, right. For example, uh, or these, I'll briefly describe what these G variables mean. Um, first, we can consider one the average of one partition function, z left. Then we have only one type of g variable, g sub left left. That describes correlations within that one copy of the system at times t and t prime. For an average of z left, z right, like the spectral form factor, we have left left variables, right right variables, and left right variables. For now, the left right variables describe correlations between time t in one system and time t prime in another system. Saddle points in these G left right variables, uh, saddle points with the G left right variables non zero, we interpret as wormholes. So here we've, we've drawn a picture of uh, 
a rough picture of a bulk interpretation for these G, uh, G sigma saddle points. So a saddle point with G left, right, not equal to zero means that there's correlation between the left and the right hand side. So that uh, we interpret as there's a wormhole in the bulk. For fixed choice of, uh, of, of the couplings, we can still write these G sigma integrals. Uh, now to compute a product of partition functions, C left, C right, uh, instead of having a single G sigma description, we actually have a choice of two descriptions. The first is a description which manifestly factorizes. We write Z left as an integral over G left, left variables. We write Z right as an integral over G right, right variables. And we take a product of the two integrals. In the second description, we introduce G left, right variables as well. This description doesn't manifestly factorize. In all of these integrals, the actions depend on the specific choice of couples. So these two descriptions, these two G-sigma descriptions of this product of partition functions are analogous of our two ways of computing a product of partition functions in gravity. The first is computing without wormholes. Second is computing with wormholes because this integral has G left, right. These left, right variables are auxiliary fields and you can integrate them out exactly. Uh, with delta function like integral to see the equivalence between these two descriptions. Sorry, are you average in our couplings here? Oh, I'm here I'm choosing a specific choice of the couplings and the actions depend on that specific choice. So instead of trying to see this equivalence uh, using this exact uh, integral over the left right variables, we can instead look at saddle points in these two versions of the integral and compare them. You can study this problem in detail in simplified versions of the SYK model, but it turns out to be a little bit more intuitive, I think, uh, to describe the, our conjecture for the full SYK model. So we'll do that on the next slide. So if you compute the spectral form factor, Z left, Z right, without these LR variables, our conjecture is that there's saddle points corresponding to the disk and the half wormhole, such that the spectral form factor takes its form disk plus half wormhole squared. I pictured this on the right here. On the other hand, we can compute the spectral form factor with the LR variables, and there's a wormhole saddle point with G left right not equal to zero, and a linked half wormhole saddle point with G left right equal to zero. By the equality of these two integrals, we can infer that these saddle points, the wormhole and linked half wormholes, are related to this, to the unlinked half wormholes like this. So in each of these three contributions, uh, the left left variables and the right right variables uh, on, at these saddle points should be the same. Should have the same left right left left correlation in the wormhole as in the half wormhole and linked half wormholes. The only difference between these th three saddle points is the value of the g left right variable. In the wormhole, g left right is non zero. In the linked half wormholes, g left right equals zero. That is why we draw it as two disconnected pieces of space time. In this third piece, a product of two half wormholes, there's no G left right variable in the problem at all. So in the SYK model, uh, this exclusion effect relating these uh, linked half wormholes and wormholes and unlinked half wormholes seem to have somewhat of a different origin than in JT gravity, where we saw it from integrating out these wormholes. So we can see uh, what I mean by taking the contribution of two half wormholes and multiplying them together. Then we can introduce these left right variables as auxiliary fields. This allows for something like the possibility of connection between the left and the right. In this integral over the left right variables, there's two saddle points. One is the wormhole, one is the linked half wormhole. So the linked half wormholes and the wormholes are just two saddle points within this one integral. They're sort of continuously connected in this integral. They're less, in some way, less distinct than the corresponding contributions in the gravity model of the study. So, I'm going to end with a, a couple comments about prospects for conventional ADS CFT. Uh, in conventional examples of ADS CFT, there's no obvious boundary ensemble. This suggests that in the bulk side, we should find that partition functions in the no boundary state should give the correct factorized answer. In these models we studied, we found these half wormholes by integrating out wormholes connecting to the alpha state boundaries. 
In a no-boundary state, there are no boundaries to connect to. So where do we get the half -worm? Perhaps there are still half or more contributions, or some chaotic bulk physics gives a noise rather than, rather than some random alpha state. Um, this, no, this chaotic bulk physics should know something about the boundary energy levels. Um, there's some speculations maybe about these half wormholes uh, involving end of the world brains or fuzzballs, but I want to briefly describe uh, an intriguing possibility, um, which is that these half wormholes end on the black hole singularity. So to see what I mean, uh, we consider the higher dimensional double cone. The double cone is a quotient of the eternal black hole uh, so that it's periodic in short style time. So this eternal black hole has a singularity and we can see it, for example, by including a time fold in the double cone geometry. Here, the time fold, uh, we look at the middle of the double cone geometry, that's the bifurcation surface. So a time fold would include a piece of the interior of the black hole which is now periodically identified in Schwarzschild time, there's a spatial coordinate. So the time fold is in now that our time like R coordinate, which we can take to run near the singularity and back. So a speculative half wormhole will be just half of this double cone. Where we project, instead of gluing these two double cones, it will be half of this double cone, where we project onto a random looking state nearer at the singularity. If we take two copies of this double cone and average, these two double cones, these two half wormholes will be glued together to make this double cone. This would connect to the black hole final state proposal of Horowitz and Maldacena. Um, and so now this is a long side. I'm just going to leave it up for you to peruse because I'm out of time. Um, I'll just make a final comment. So perhaps the uh, most strange question is what are these linked half wormholes? Why are they off diagonal? Uh, um, it's also important to note that this linking changes the contribution of these half wormholes by an order one amount, so it's not a small effect. Uh, we found this, this linking coming from uh, wormholes connecting to these shared uh, psi boundaries in JT gravity. Uh, but in the no boundary state, there are no psi boundaries to connect to. So you don't have this phenomenon of shared psi boundaries and the fact that you can't connect with the same boundaries at the same time. So it seems like we need a different explanation. Uh, for this exclusion effect uh, if we're going to be working the no boundary state. And so here's some uh, comments to look at if I'm now out of time. Or maybe one last important thing. So I also assumed to have this talk basically that we should take the wormhole seriously as a contribution and that it should contribute. Maybe that's not true, but you need some sort of principle to not include it. So for uh, for your conversation for the psi alpha uh, inner product with d prime, you 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 didn't compute it from some method, but just mentioned the factorization formula. Sorry, can you repeat the last part? Oh, uh, so so you how do you get that inner product with psi r with d prime? Is that just simply match the the factorization equation, right? Oh, um, maybe to be more clear, I'll go back to a slide. So this, so how do I, you're saying, how do I compute this? Yes. Oh, so um, what I've done here is mostly said that if we have these, compare these two versions of the calculation, you can infer that it's uh, related to this quantity via this equation. But you can also compute that directly by using some explicit representation of the state. Now the state is supposed to project on a specific member of the ensemble. It's probably a uh, wave function is given by a delta function. So it's an easy state to deal with. You can compute that explicitly in certain examples. Explicitly, you mean you, you can have some geometric uh, sum over the topologies? Yeah, so in this picture here, if you just represent psi alpha as the appropriate superposition of boundaries created by these C operators, then you can just do this computation. Okay. And it's, it's simple to do because this state is it's simple. It's just a delta function. For example, you re represent the delta function using an integral dp e to the i p z. Uh, and then it's sort of simple. Lisa, Phil, when you say the, the b b prime psi alpha in a product is the off diagonal part, you don't mean that it's zero b and b prime are the same. 
No, so it's not exactly, that's something I didn't really have time to go into. Let's say if we, if we imagine it's for simplicity, instead of using this continuous B basis, we use the, some uh, uh, discrete basis. We have I, J instead of B and B prime. This delta function is a delta I, J. Uh, then it turns out that this, this thing is zero on the diagonals up to some small correction, which is uh, like one over square root of the number of states. Uh, yeah. With approximately off diagonal. In the higher dimensional case, there are some indication that these small holes have many negative modes, which would, I think, provide some sort of principle for non inclusion. Yeah, so there's in the specific example I've uh, mentioned the most this double column. Uh, this, this double column. There hasn't been a, that sort of, no one's found this sort of problem, these negative modes in that uh, solution. It seems to pass a number of tests. So um, as of yet, I don't know of any uh, good reason to, to throw that. Okay. Another question? Um, just confused about, uh, well, shouldn't the left right correlator be not zero for the linked half wormhole in order to get a zero left right correlator for the, uh, for the exactly factorized guy? Um, the, the, exact no, the, 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 the left right correlator is not uh, necessarily zero because there's these. Uh, so you put a put a operator in there. You can have the, the small one point function. Of no, I, I mean the uh, subtractor, subtractor one point. Oh, the, the, yeah, the, but the connected two if you look at the connected function, then yeah, it should be uh, zero, but. It's, you can still have that be true with this g left right being on zero. Uh, what's the intuition behind that? Maybe if you if you look at, uh, I don't, actually yeah, I don't know a good way to explain that. Very Though maybe I'll say if you look at this, but there's an equation like this in the simplified version of that's one thing one time point. Mm -hmm. There it's uh, very clear that the g left right is supposed to be equal to zero. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. The idea that G left right is zero classically, but the quantum fluctuations are correlated. So I'm, I'm not. I'm actually not sure that might be the case. I haven't really thought about this very much. Or is it? Is it that the that the uh, let me see. Uh, one point functions. The one point functions on the far left are going to be zero. Is that right? When I compute the side left right. Oh, um, on this this on this wormhole, the one point functions. Uh, yes. And now the idea that the one point functions of the middle term are going to cancel the connected one. I, that's the sort of bulk picture of why. Yeah. Um, so the one point function in this thing, roughly, you can think of having some contribution where it connects to the end of this half worm mode that's supposed to reproduce the two point function on this. Okay. And so, what do you mean by g left right equals zero there is the connected, the connected part. Uh, yes. Okay. 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 It's referring to your uh, last couple of slides on the, the idea uh, about the singularity. In, in, in what sense, um, how precise can, can we make that? Uh, uh, I, I worry that somehow the singularity we're always expecting to that get in any generic the theory to be somewhat corrected away. And so I'm concerned that I, I, I wouldn't have a good place that I would call the singularity in, in, in general. Yeah, um, that's a good question. So what I can say is in this classical half wormhole geometry, this idea that you can just put a time fold here that goes up near the singularity or arbitrarily close to it, uh, that you can precise. It's just a classical geometry. Um, the idea that you have a half wormhole that ends in the singularity, I maybe should put speculative in bold because that is, I don't know how to make that precise. I just want to do it. But I, I believe, so uh, in this black hole final state proposal, it's 
I feel like I would suffer from the same issue. It's how do you precisely describe that in that case? Um, but there seems to be some indication, at least, that's a sensible thing to think about. Thanks. Okay, so let's thank Bill again.